All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time joining us, we are all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find anywhere from 40, 50, even 60 live events a month uh, for your classrooms to join in on the action. Of course, we love to have you with us. Well, today is a really special event. May, it's a big month in general. May is a big celebration for biodiversity as we head towards the 22nd, which is the International Day for Biological Diversity. And today's event is just gonna be something special. We're connecting obviously with the amazing team of uh, Sunva Sorby and Hilda Strom coming to us live from Arctic Svalbard. So in 2019, 2020, they made history when they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. So they spent 12 months at the remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu, located 78 degrees north and 148 uh, kilometers from their closest neighbors, the town of Long Yerbian in Svalbard. Climate change isn't taking a break, so neither did they. They returned to Svalbard in November and have overwintered at Bumsabu again. And in fact, they're a few weeks away uh, from heading home from another incredible uh, uh, season at uh, Bumsabu. So together with a team of global partners, Hearts in the Ice is a bridge between science and global citizens to better understand climate change and why we all need to play an important role. So they continue to serve as citizen scientists on a variety of projects from observing clouds and the auroras to flying drones, monitoring ice, uh, taking phytoplankton samples and ice cores as they built on a second year of data collection. So I'm gonna bring them in live with us via satellite phone. Hilda and Sonova, how are we doing today? Hello, Joe and everybody on the call. We're doing very well, thanks. A beautiful day here. Excellent. It is always great uh, to have you live with us. I've got an image of the two of you with your polar bear alarm and companion Etra uh, pulled up on the screen. Um, we're excited to hear your voices and fingers crossed we get to see you at the end of the call as well. Yep, we will absolutely come back on the uh, video at the end. So thanks for that, Joe. I just want to make a quick reference to the um, the fact that we made history last year. And it's sort of a fun thing. While we did stay here alone with Etra, uh, it takes a village, as, as all of us know, to pull something off being so remote. So, you know, we would have never been able to stay here as long as we are without um, a tremendous amount of support from, from people like you, Joe. Um, who have held the whole educational piece together and uh, lots of support in logistics and stuff. So I just want to, I just wanted to call that out. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Hila, who has some pretty exciting things to share about what we're seeing outside the door here. Yes. Hi, everyone. So uh, what's happening outside Bum Sabu just now? Well, three months ago, we had polar nights and now it is actually midnight sun already. So it is Spring, uh, spring is in the air, even here in the high Arctic, and uh, it is still minus degrees, and snow is covering most of the tundra, but uh, we have some bare spots here and there, and the ice is gone, except, except all the way into the inner part of the fjords, and uh, everything is coming to life, and it's mating season. So, um, you have some pictures there from us, um, Joe, I and do. we have some migrating birds. Yes, you do. Uh, we have some migrating birds um, that has arrived already, like Ader ducks and, and King Ader. We have them right outside uh, our window, and we can actually see a few of them just as we speak. We have open sea here now. So, and our local birds are ptarmigan, and they are so adapted to small bud with um, a coat even on their legs. And uh, it's white during winter and brownish, brown gray during summer in order to be camouflaged. And then we have the Arctic uh, foxes and they are so beautiful. And the picture you have, uh, Joe, we took last night and um, you can see it's starting to change. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little uh, grayish already around the, its neck. And uh, the polar fox, actually has the warmest coat in the world. Um, we have hardly seen any of them this winter since many of them perished last winter. It was a very hard uh, winter for polar foxes uh, around here, Arctic foxes around here last winter. 
the reindeers, um, they are also very adapted and look a little different from uh, those that we have uh, other places in the world, actually. They have shorter legs, they are a little rounder, and they have thick fur. And we, as we speak, we have 14 of them around us. Um, and uh, they have had a very hard winter, and it seems still that many of them will survive until their food plants bloom. And then we have this have this most tender experience with a walrus mom and her pup, uh, just turning around the corner here, coming uh, floating in on the drift ice, uh, drift flow, and the pup pup was nursing. That was um, just something we will never forget. We had this uh, moment for hours, actually, just outside our door here. And then we have polar bears, and. Um, we know that polar bear, um, the polar bear mom that we have been following for uh, the Norwegian Polar Institute has at least one cub this year. And we have seen the tracks and that's so exciting. So um, all in all, it has been a very hard winter for our local wildlife, especially reindeers and Arctic polar, uh, polar uh, Arctic foxes and, and polar bears. And the reindeers um, experience ice covering their food plants due to rain during winter and they're the polar bear have had little sea ice where they find their main food source, which is seals. But they are all trying to adapt, both reindeer and polar bears. We have seen from their poop samples that they are eating uh, kelp. They're trying to, um, they have been feeding on kelp during the winter, trying to, to get enough to eat. So even if the climate is changing and threatening many of the species, they all try and struggle to adapt. The question is if it's time, because the changes happen far too fast. Oh, it looks like our connection just disconnected. It happens sometimes when you're connecting with satellite phone and they're already calling back. So let me get them back on the phone here. Hey. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, have us back. Um, hey, Joe, it's Cinnava here, and I'll just start with a photo of us uh, shoved in a small little um, tiny home. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> okay. Um, Wade, I was uh, joking about your library, saying you have a lot more books uh, behind you than we do here at Bumsaboo, and that is not what you're looking at right now is not Bumsaboo. That's uh, here we in our sauna, which we had the pleasure of using for a couple of seasons here, and it was packed up. It was really sad, actually. It was packed up and towed by snowmobile on a sled uh, back to Longyearby in two weekends ago. So uh, you mentioned it early, Joe. We are leaving, um, and we have until May 20th, something like that, um, to pack up just a whole whack of stuff. Uh, and just leaving here involves a tremendous amount of coordination. Um, but, you know, we've been here for 17 months at the very same location. Uh, this has been a big benefit for all the data we've been collecting, but it's changed us. And it's we're still reeling with, you know, what have we learned? What have we observed? Um, what is the value of, of staying present to and bearing witness to all of these changes? And and we'll roll that out in the, in the weeks to come, but um, there's just a, a, a lot we have to share that's, that's been such a privilege for us to, uh, to be here and experience. And if you can roll to the, the beautiful of the midnight sun, uh, it's very hard to sleep here uh, for this very reason. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, uh, we went to the glacier last night and we came back at like two o'clock in the morning. Um, it's uh, It's been pretty amazing to be in a place where you see the shifts from, not just from season to season, but literally hour to hour. And we really want to thank you, Joe. Um, you've hosted some amazing speakers over the course of all of those months, and we've been able to share stories and information with what's close to 100,000 youth now on subjects like technology, weather, our ocean, polar bears, the importance of mental and physical health, climate change. And we're ending with a theme that is really um, like big picture, biodiversity. And, and we can't think of a better person uh, than Wade Davis to actually tie all of this together so we can understand the value of 
not just seeing and understanding our world, but seeing it through the lens of different perspectives and cultures. So we're we're really, really excited today, Wade. Um, and thank you from the very bottom of our melted hearts <laughs> for joining us today. We're, we're deeply honored. And I'll, I'll just end with the last photo there, just sending all of you a little bit of peace from this place. Uh, we have violent storms and, you know, just really raging weather almost all the time. But we have days like this too. Um, and we've been spending time writing, um, you know, photography, observing and all of that. And, and I just think of how absolutely incredible it is, how serendipitous it is that I would travel up to Bumsabu with two of Wade Davis's books. And finally, only now did I have the time to read them. So, um, you know, for all of you out there, don't waste time. Pick up that book on your bookshelf and read it. What's so interesting uh, right now about the theme of biodiversity is that throughout our history, the climate has always changed with ecosystems and species coming and going. The difference now is that the change is actually escalating fast, that it's affecting the ecosystems and the species' ability to adapt. And so that's what's contributing to biodiversity loss. And we've learned, you know, a few things from you already, Wade. Species loss is one thing. We're also losing culture. We're losing languages. And we're losing the wisdom from our ancestors. So for all of you on the call today, remember that teachers are everywhere. Um, and we have to really engage in story to understand that. So a huge, huge thank you also to Citrix for supporting our education outreach system. And I want to hand it back to you, Joe. And um, we'll, get this, we'll get this show on the road. Thank you so much. All right, excellent. Well, Hilden Cinema, thank you so much for sharing some of that amazing wildlife that you have around you. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, and thank you for some of, the, some of those scenes as well. Um, such a special place that you've been able to spend so much time in and see that change and witness that change uh, over two seasons. Absolutely incredible. All right, well, it's my pleasure now to bring in Wade Davis. Wade is a uh, professor of Anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. Between 2000 uh, and 2013, he served as Explorer in Residence at the National Geographic Society and was named one of their Explorers for the Millennium. He's been described as a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. Um, and through, uh, mostly through the Harvard Botanical Museum, he spent over three years in the Amazon and the Andes as a plant explorer. He's lived uh, uh, living among 15 indigenous groups, eight in Latin America uh, nations, while making some 6,000 botanical collections. He has traveled everywhere, uh, from East Africa, Borneo, Nepal, Peru, Polynesia, Tibet, um, New Guinea, Australia, Colombia, Vanuatu, Mongolia, the list goes on and on and on. Of course, the high Arctic like Nunavut uh, and Greenland. In his spare time, he's published 350 scientific uh, papers and, and popular articles, 23 books and numerous film credits. And in 2016 was named um, or made a member of the Order of Canada. So let's bring Wade in with us now. Wade, how are we doing today? Hi, Joe. What a wonderful, what a wonderful couple of fantastic women, scholars, scientists, explorers. It's just a joy to be with all of you, all three of you, Joe. And thanks for all, all your work in keeping this uh, incredible initiative going and bringing their voices into classrooms all over the world. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Wade. Um, we're going to do a little Q&A action together. You and I had a great talk uh, a few days ago, and it got me thinking with some ideas for questions, and then we're gonna let the students take over because I know they're gonna have lots of questions about exploration and, and biodiversity, so we don't wanna keep them waiting too, too long. So I'm gonna start off kind of on the on the lighter side. Let's start with a nice, easy question to start. You've been all over the world. You've, you've seen and experienced so many things, um, and let's, let's start nice and simple. So can you tell us a little bit about the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, the weirdest thing I've ever eaten. Um... Well, it's not really something I've eaten, but when I was working in uh, Haiti, um, investigating the the folk preparations supposedly used in the to create zombies, I had a, a, a sort of a confrontation with a negative priest, uh, a bokor, and uh, it was just a little bit of a. This sounds more kind of bravado than my work normally is, but it there was just this moment where 
where trust was being established. And this is a kind of an important lesson for young people. They always say, you know, how do you go off to a, a distant culture, let alone a distant indigenous group? And how do you break down the barrier that exists between you and a people with whom you hope to be welcomed as a guest? And, and the answer is never actually bravado. It's more empathy and love, the same traits that and, and, and of character and, and behavior that would make you welcome or make me welcome in your house at Thanksgiving. If I turn up at your house at Thanksgiving in the States and your mom or dad have spent the day making a delicious turkey and I announce I'm a vegan, it kind of puts a damper on the day. So this idea of you know, sleeping where you're asked to sleep, eating what you're asked to eat, sleeping on the stony ground, self-deprecating humor, uh, compassion, love, good manners. This is These are universal uh, traits. But in this particular case, uh, there was a bit of a confrontation, and he handed me a, a bottle of raw alcohol, which had human remains in it and uh, seeds and dried fish and dried snakes and all kinds of things. And it was just sort of a moment. And I, I knew biologically that the alcohol would have uh, pickled or, or, or purified any of the strange looking ingredients. So I, I took a big drink of it um and ha passed it right back to him and he laughed and he took a big drink and then he said to me what kind of white person are you and of course white in haiti is not white as in terms of a racial trait it just means outsider so he was saying you know what kind of stranger are you anyway you know and sometimes sometimes things like that you know food is power it's really important you know um uh many times and on a more serious note joe there have been many times, I mean, generally when you're living among indigenous people uh, in, in pristine forests, the food is impeccably clean, obviously, for obvious reasons. But often where you get sick with dis uh, gastrointestinal problems is in, 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 in more impoverished communities, the borderlands where sanitation may be wanting. And there have been many, many, many times when I've taken a plate of food from a, a, a modest family, a humble family, knowing full well that there's a very good chance that I might get amoebic dysentery or giardi or some other um, uh, affliction, I will always eat that food because you can always treat the affliction readily, but you can never rekindle the trust broken by essentially through a gesture saying to people, I'm better than you, your food's not good enough for me. So food really is power. And I think that's especially true in, in, in the Arctic. You know, when you or out with the Inuit, for example, you might not think that pure uh, blubber or pure fat, known as muktuk, uh, to the in, in, in Nuptutuk, would be would be palatable to the, those of us who have been taught to be averse to raw fat or bacon even. But actually, in the high Arctic, as I know that uh, Hilden and uh, Sinova will, will, will agree, fat becomes energy. It becomes like rocket fuel. You can't get enough of it. All right. Awesome, Wade. And I think that it's, it's a tricky question, too, because when you ask what's the weirdest food, well, it might be weird to us. But when you're visiting somewhere, that's just that's. Well, crazy. Joe, you know, it's so funny to say that because people are always asking me, how did you become an anthropologist? And, you know, I, I could give one answer, but you know, there are really a couple answers. When I was a little boy, four or five, I lived in Montreal in Canada at a time when the French and English didn't speak to each other. And um uh, there was literally a border in my community but that divided the two the, the, the two worlds, those who spoke French and those who spoke English. And my mother would send me to a little shop on the corner of that frontier to get her cigarettes or milk, whatever we needed in the house. And I remember at the age of five, peering across that boulevard, Cartier Boulevard, and thinking, wow, across the way, there's another language, another religion, another way of life. And I was just dying to cross that road. And I did, uh, ignoring all the echoes and ghosts of bigotry or prejudice, not from my family, but from my community. And I, in a way, I've been crossing that road ever since. But I recently, funnily enough, you should say that, Joe, because I stumbled upon cleaning out our basement, what might be called the first speech or term paper I ever wrote. And I must have been 9 or 10 or 11 years old, and it was called One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison. And it went up at food traditions around the world, all the things that we think are delicacies, snails, for example, that would disgust an Amazonian uh, hunter and gatherer and all the things that they may eat that we might find to be um, uh, be queasy about. The point is with food, if another human being is eating it, you can eat it because we're all brothers and sisters and biologically we're one and the same. 
All right. Well, wait, I want to turn things a little uh, towards our connection with nature. So when we talked earlier, we talked a little bit about how, you know, in, in the Western world, our connection, we're so, we're so disconnected. That connection is broken. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Um, kind of yeah, yeah. Group in with? yeah, you know, I, I was really touched by listening to Hilda and, and uh, Sinova. You know, what, what they, 17 months in the same place. I once went to the great American poet, Gary Snyder, who's really sort of the patron saint of the deep ecology movement. And the deep ecology movement just is, is that movement where we really began to think about our sense of place on the planet. You know, the idea that landscape determines character, culture springs from a spirit of place. The Inuit uh, people of the high Arctic, for example, are, their entire personality is, is, is formed by the ice honed on the edge of the ice, the way it forms, the way it recedes, the, the sharpness of it in the winter. Um, you know, they live with a fatal indifference because in the Arctic, that's the only choice they have. You know, it was a lack of sentimentality that really shocked British explorers in the, in the Canadian Arctic. But of course, if you know that life, that's the only thing that is possible. But when I went to Gary, when I was a young man, I said, Gary, what's the most important thing we can do for the environment? He said, stay put. And he was talking about this idea of fidelity to place. Now, we all love to travel, but it's also really wonderful to have a sense of home, not only because it's comforting, but because that becomes our place to defend. You know, we can't take on the whole issue of global climate change as an individual. We can't even take on the issue of loss of biodiversity. We can't even protect a river on our own, but we can be loyal to the patch of ground that we have, you know, in our homes, in our backyards, down the street, in the in in the parks around us. So I think that's a, a really important point. And, and one of the things that's important to remember too about climate change is that it's become humanity's problem, but it wasn't caused by humanity. It was caused by a quite narrow uh, uh, cultural view of humanity, which happens to be the one that we embrace and celebrate uh, in the Western European tradition. But most people around the world played no role in the creation of this dilemma. And yet they, as we know, are the ones, particularly in the Arctic, the stunning example where the world of the Inuit is melting from beneath them, um, who are bearing the consequences of this, of this um, uh, challenge. And it, it's very important to remember that climate change for us is either an economic opportunity, a political debate in some quarters, a scientific challenge, a technical challenge, but if you believe, as most peoples in the world do, most indigenous societies believe that they are responsible for the well-being of the world. And so for them, climate change suggests that the earth is in pain, that the earth is sick, and they think it's their fault. So therefore, it becomes very much a kind of a psychological uh, uh, a blow, an emotional blow to them. And the reason for that is rather simple. In our Western tradition, if you think and most of the kids in this audience, um, we grew up, as I did, to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock, didn't we? We never thought that a mountain was alive. We weren't taught that it could be a deity. We, we, we never were told that a forest was the abode of the home of spirits that we would have to embrace when we became teenagers and went through our initiation rites, right? So we, we kind of came to see the forest as a source of timber. We saw the mountains as a source of ore, metals that we could mine from the earth. Well, that's fine, but it does mean that we kind of deanimated. We took life out of the earth itself. But the most peoples around the world see it very differently. They see a mountain as perhaps a deity, a god that will direct their destiny, or a forest as the abode of, of, of spirits as well. Now, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. That's not how things really work. The important thing is, how does the way you think about a place change your attitude toward it, particularly in terms of your environmental impact? If you think a mountain's just a pile of rock, well, heck, you know, why not mine it? But if you think it is the equivalent to the Vatican, you're going to hesitate with really profound consequences for the impact of your society. And I think one of the lessons of my lifetime uh, is that we've discovered that the earth is our home. You know, uh, uh, it was only when I was, what, 14 years old that we first had a view of the earth from space. And we saw that we weren't this infinite 
um, uh, horizon, we were this tiny blue marble floating in, as the astronauts said, the velvet void of space. And I think that changed everything. And we began to think in new ways. You know, here we are talking with all of you about biodiversity. Well, that was a term that was only made up by Ed Wilson and Tom Lovejoy, both friends of mine, uh, it, it well within my professional lifetime. When I was your age, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was considered an environmental victory. So we, we've really come a long way and we have a long way still to go. All right. Uh, awesome way. Thank you so much for that perspective. Uh, and you know, you're so right. Um, we do have a long way to go. Um, and I love the way that you, you know, you brought it around with, we can't do everything, but we can protect our home, our, our community, our area. And if everybody's doing that, that's, what's going to have a huge impact, uh, on a global scale. All right. Well, I think it's time to meet some classrooms. I think, uh, we'd love to take some questions. Um, so we're going to meet, uh, those on YouTube. Uh, I can already see some questions coming in. We're going to pick some of your questions, but keep those coming there. We're going to visit some of our camera classrooms and then anything's fair game, biodiversity talks about travel and exploration. And of course, questions about the Arctic, uh, and what Hilda and Sunova have been up to. So let's get things started with one of our camera classrooms. We're going to start off. Let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Boland's class. They're joining us uh, in Courtenay, British Columbia. Looks like a fifth grade class. Let's bring them up here to say hi. How are we doing, fifth graders? What's one reoccurring thing that you've noticed in the different cultures you've been to? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tell me again. What's one thing that you have noticed in many of the cultures you've been to? She's looking for a recurring theme that you've seen. Well, I think that's actually a wonderful question because you know what's so fantastic about all of us? This is really important. You know, I mentioned about going to the, the the vision of the Earth from space, but there's been another incredible scientific journey in my lifetime, in your lifetime, and that's gone inside of ourselves, into the very genetic essence of who we are. And in my lifetime, scientists have shown that race is a total fiction. It's not, there is no such thing as race. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We are all descendants of the same common ancestors. And including those who walked out of Africa 65,000 years ago. But, but this is so, so very, very important because it means the end of racism and it means the end of the notion of race in that sense. But more, more importantly, it, it, it shows that we are all interconnected as one single species around the world. And that makes sense. What's fascinating about anthropology is that we all share the same needs. You know, we all have to give birth to children. We have to figure out ways to educate those kids. We have to find, find ways to marry that are consistent. Now, they can change the rules of marriage culture to culture. Some, some cultures say that a man can marry multiple women. Some say a woman can marry multiple men. There are cultures in the world that have neither husbands nor fathers. But the bottom line is the rules are consistent. By the same token, we have to figure out how we deal with the mystery of death. And the real essence of every religion, for example, and one of the things my dad used to always tell me is that nobody's got the monopoly on the route to God, um, is how we deal with death. I mean, every religion comes down to how a people answer the mystery implied by the fact that ultimately we all have to die. And so no one's got a monopoly on that. We're all just... You know, it's like my father used to say, every every religious institution should have a billboard outside saying important if true. That means that all religions um, deserve a place at the Council of Human uh, Wisdom. Uh, and, and so what's fascinating is that given our common needs in every culture of the world, people in all of our ingenuity have found so many cool ways to live, to adapt. And I think this is really what cultural diversity is all about. It's our strength, just like biological diversity is our strength. You know, um, people are always saying, you know, what difference does it matter, for example, to someone uh, living in, in New England if a plant species disappears in Germany? Or what difference does it make to the Torg uh, of the deserts of Mali 
if the people of Quebec disappear? Well, the answer is probably it doesn't matter either to either if the other event happens, but it does matter to humanity as a whole. You know, most people will never see a, um, a painting by Van Gogh in a museum. Most people will never hear a Mozart symphony. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it, the world would not be a weaker place or lesser place were either great artists not to have lived. The best way of thinking about biodiversity and cultural diversity, for that matter, is imagine, as my friend Tom Lovejoy says, you're getting on a plane. And as you're getting on the plane, you notice the mechanic is popping out the rivets in the wings. And you say, what are you doing with the wings there? What are you popping those rivets? Out? Oh, we, every time we sell a rivet, we can lower your fare and you get a cheaper flight home to Courtney. Uh, yeah, but wait a minute. What? And you ask the obvious question. What about if you take too many off and the wing falls off? And the uh, mechanic just says, well, well, we've never had that problem yet. It, it's a little bit the same with cultural diversity. You know, through 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 time, uh, cultures, of course, have come and gone. Languages have disappeared. We no longer speak Latin in the streets of Rome. But before Latin disappeared, of course, it had time to leave its descendants, which we know as the Romance languages of Europe, Spanish and Italian and, and French and so on. But today, like species, languages are disappearing at a cataclysmic rate. So that, for example, the year that you were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just vocabulary or grammar. A language is a way that the spirit of every particular culture comes into the world. I, I, I once wrote that every language is like an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And today, fully half the languages of humanity are not being taught to school children. Now think about it. there you are in a classroom in Courtney, uh, and and many of you will will speak multiple languages. But for the moment, your language that you use is English. How would you feel if you knew that you were the last speaker in the universe who could speak English? That you had no way to communicate to anyone. You couldn't pass on everything you had learned from your parents um, to your children, uh, or anticipate. The the, 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 the the love and the fun that you're going to have with your kids. Well, that is actually the fate of someone around the world roughly every two weeks, because on average, about every two weeks, some old elder dies and carries with them in the, into the grave the last syllables of an ancient language. So this doesn't have to happen. And when we lose a language or lose a culture or lose, lose, lose a plant species, we're losing something of ourselves. All right. Thank you for that great question from our crew in British Columbia. And such a great point to to rise. You know, we always think about biodiversity. We think about it in the, you know, the the, the nature sense, but um, we don't always think about the, the, the wealth of diversity we have of cultures uh, and the languages that come along with it. So, and those are just as important to preserve for, you know, for our history. Um, and, well, not preserve, but, you know, we, pres we preserve Joe Jam. You don't right. preserve culture, you know. Right. This is a fantastic thing. Cultures are always changing. We're all always changing. The real question is not the traditional versus the modern. It's how do we find a way that all peoples can benefit from the modern, the best of the modern, without that engagement having to demand that they lose all their roots and tradition, because those roots aren't just quaint and colorful. They're fountains of wisdom that can benefit all of us. All right. Good stuff. I'm going to grab a question from YouTube here. We've got um, let's see, who should we grab one from here? Um, okay, we've got a grade five, six class hanging out with us in Fergus, Ontario, uh, Miss Smith's class. I'm gonna steer this question towards Hilda and Sunova. Uh, they're wondering about advice that you would give children who are passionate about climate change. What could they do to kind of get started? Um, great question. I think uh, this is a start right here is, is, is you know, just getting exposed to different perspectives, different ways of um, uh, experiencing the world. As we are up here for 17 months, seeing the world through the eyes of the wildlife of the Arctic and its changes here, and and the world uh, that Wade has experienced through his travels and all the different cultures. So, um, education is absolutely uh, imperative. Um, so, stay in school. Oh, this is a good thing. 
we would also encourage, you know, deep curiosity and, um, you know, Wade, your point about if you look at rocks like just a pile of rocks, you're likely to mine it. But if you look at it as a sacred deity or something, you're likely to protect it. And um, to look at the world through the eyes of uh, a protector and, and a caretaker instead of a taker. Uh, I think this is a very important thing we've learned up here that we, you know, respect the fact that we're living here in harmony with our uh, environment. We're not here to, to take from it, just to live in peace. And that's a very different way that most, you know, social civilized, uh, I'll call them civilized populations live in dense populations. So um, curiosity, finding the citizen science projects would be a really super cool way to understand something you don't know. And it's a, it's a gentle way to... Um, keep your mind engaged and understand from start to finish how one little thing like a, a, a bee or a plant has a role to play in this very diverse, beautiful ecosystem that we all want to protect so, so much. I hope that uh, answered the question or shed light. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, we're going to jump to another crew here. I'm going to share their screen here because we can see all the the virtual students. So let's bring them up there. There they are. I'll bring their teacher in as well. Mrs. Carr is joining us today. How are we doing today, everyone? Hi. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. Good. 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 Great to see everyone. Mrs. Carr, you're joining us from Brampton today, Brampton, Ontario. That's, that's a very enriching conversation happening. And I'm trying to take in all of the information there. I have a cease who has a question about the Arctic wildlife. Assis, do you want to ask the question? Assis, do you want to ask the question? Sure. So, um, have you ever seen like an iceberg with penguins sliding down? Well, Assis, the important thing is to remember penguins are found in Antarctica <laughs> to the south and um, not in the, the Arctic. Uh, but I've certainly seen lots of penguins. Sometimes you can go and see there, there are literally hundreds of thousands of penguins. And they really do look like we always think. They really do look like they're wearing a uh, dress to, to dance in a ballroom or something. They kind of, they, they, they walk around like they're kind of really full of themselves. And they're, they're really, um, they're so tame because in most of the places they've never been hunted. So you can get really close to them and just lie on the ground and they'll walk right over you or by you or whatever. It's kind of fun. But I'll tell you, in the Canadian Arctic, the thing you should remember and maybe dream to go to is we forget that most animals cannot overwinter. In, they don't spend the winter in the Arctic. Um, the only species that stay overwinter in the Canadian Arctic are ring seals, polar bears, and the people themselves. And so when in the darkness, when an Inuk hunter, an Inuit man, uh, wants to hunt, he goes to a breathing seal, a, a hole in the ice of a seal, and he waits patiently with his harpoon until the seal comes up. But if he doesn't find a seal, he will then curl up on the ice to try to look like a seal to deliberately attract the polar bear who will try to hunt him so he can try to kill the polar bear. And meanwhile, everybody else disappears. And then right about now, the height of it would be about a month from now. If you can imagine, if you could be at the tip of Baffin Island, looking out over a sound that we call in English Lancaster Sound, which is the opening to the Northwest Passage, over 17 million animals swim by. Narwhals, belugas, bearded seals, everybody harp seals, everybody comes home. And then they go all through the Arctic and then they at the end of the season, they have to disappear once again into the waters between Greenland and Canada. All right, absolutely amazing. That would be, I mean, it's just a, an amazing place and to see those seasonal changes. And, you know, that's probably what Hilda and some of us are seeing right now, some of those those changes with the, the sun being back, the midnight sun and uh, different species starting to reappear. Uh, it must be an incredible time uh, to be there right now. I am going to bring in, let's see, Mr. Patrick's crew, grade eights in London, Ontario. Let's get them into the call. There's Mr. Patrick. Hey, Mr. Patrick, how are you? Yeah, there. Hi, Wade. Thanks so much. Hi. Uh, this is a question, I guess, for all the presenters from Aiden. 
Aiden asked, what's the best way to keep biodiversity alive and diverse, and I guess maybe in our own space, as you mentioned? I would say protect, you know, protect your local home area, you know, pay attention to your own streams, your own rivers, your own parks, pay attention to what people in your community are doing that might impact the biological world negatively. And above all, educate yourself. You know, the funny thing, uh, Mr. Patrick, I got a PhD in biology, but I didn't take a single biology class until my third year of university. And I think that, you know, I almost got through all of school without learning about nature, even though I love nature, right? But for me, biology, when I was a kid, was taught like with white frock lab technicians with formaldehyde di dissecting frogs in laboratories. I hated it. And yet I loved the outdoors. And I was just very lucky that I went off to the Amazon and discovered the wonder of plants. But I think that, um, you know, it's funny, Mr. Patrick is an educator and my daughter is a, a high school, a teacher as well. Um, you know, we, 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 put, we would never put a student through, um, through um, high school or, or let alone college who didn't know the difference between poetry and prose, the, you know, or between a painting and a photograph. And yet you can get all the way through college without even knowing the formula of photosynthesis, which is a formula of life by which plants literally eat sunlight and transform carbon dioxide uh, and water into the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe. I always joke, um, Joe, that, you know, when we ask these politicians who are always trying to represent us, we shouldn't allow anyone to serve in parliament who doesn't know the formula of photosynthesis. Absolutely. 100%. I agree with that totally. Um, Hilda and Sunova, do you want to add a little bit to that? What 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 have you been doing or what do you think students can do to help protect biodiversity? Well, Wade made a really good point. I'll hand the phone to him in a second. Um, you know, it, 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 it's just it's think globally and, and act locally. Um, that is really a super important point. It's almost um, paralyzing to think uh, of all the problems in the world. And but if we can understand that it's a problem of the world, if we can think for uh, for the world, so to speak, or think for all people, and know that that we actually can do something by by being interested in what's in our backyard, by protecting it if it's serving on a committee or somewhere, or participating in in something, and holding your uh, your politicians, holding the people in office accountable. Um, you know, they're, they're out there speaking on behalf of us, and if, and if, if they don't know that formula for photosynthesis, <laughs> take them out of office. Um, that was a great point, but it's, it's very important for all of us to exercise self-leadership and understand that we need to not only lead ourselves in this conversation and this dialogue, but also we need to hold our leaders accountable. He has something to say, too. Yes, it's. Uh, I mean, it's. Um, it's. It's now uh, that, that all of us have to do something. Uh, and um, I think one of the maybe most important thing is to be a, a thoughtful user, to waste less and to reuse and recycle and repurpose and think about how you travel, where your food comes from, take care of the bees, and understand what the insects are doing for our food production and. Um, Find out where your power comes from. Um, think about how much water you use. I mean, it's so many things we all can do in our everyday life. So I think it's um, it's uh, it's not. I mean, it's it's not difficult, but I think most important of all is to educate and, and find out how all uh, how all this is um, how things fit together. We have learned so much during our stay here at Sponsorbu for being citizen scientists and being connected with uh, the scientists. So um, what you are doing, Joe, um, having a platform and, um, and hosting experts like Wade Davis uh, is so extremely important. All right. Let's jump to Guelph, Ontario. Mr. Castro's crew is hanging out with us. Uh, grade 5, 6, I believe. How are we doing? Oh, can you grab your mic, Mr. Castro? <laughs> Sorry, our question is, 
Uh, have you ever seen the bone of an extinct animal? Mm. Uh, well, I guess every time you see a dinosaur bone in a museum, we see uh, bones of extinct animals. I mean, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, one thing I, I, I say to young people all the time, all the time, old people, it's sort of like when you uh, kids graduate and the, and the and speaker at the uh, graduation ceremony says, oh, the world's a mess. It's up to you to fix it. And it's kind of unfair. You know, they didn't mess it up. No. So I think it's really important to remember joy. I mean, you know, you know, the, the, the thing that the, there, there are great problems in the world and great environmental problems, but there have always been great problems in the world. And you have a really joyous life to live. And you can live a joyous life without being burdened by the by the problems of the world, because being burdened by them doesn't really help you solve them. But joy does. And loving compassion helps you, you know. Um, so, for example, I think my father always talked about humility. If you took, for example, the entire presence of our whole lineage as human beings, I don't just mean Homo sapiens, who we are as a species, going back to Homo erectus, who gave rise to us, and back all the way to what's called Homo afarensis, which is a distant ancestor of ours 2.3 million years ago. And you took that whole lineage that came to this point where here we are, and put it on a on a 24-hour clock of the history of the world, the planet, humans in all of our manifestations through all time would not occupy a second of a 24-hour clock. So you see, the world will endure. It's just a question of how much damage are we going to do to it and what kind of world are we going to leave to um, our, own, our own descendants. So I think you can do all of this work with a lightness of being and joy. And, you know, the most important thing when you're young, as my friend Jim Whitaker said, um, uh, the first American to climb Everest, he said, you know, if you're not living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. As you grow up, you'll discover that you can jump off cliffs and you don't land on stone. You land on a feather bed. The world exists to lift you up, not beat you down. Uh, you need to do what needs to be done and only then ask whether it was permissible or possible. Don't look around your classroom and say, oh, Johnny's really creative or Sally's really creative as if you're not creative. No, creativity doesn't exist as, as some kind of independent thing. Creativity is never the motivation for action. It's a consequence of action. You can only be creative if you do. So if you want to be a photographer, don't think it's an impossible mountain to climb to become a National Geographic photographer. Just get on with doing it. If someone says to you, I don't think you could write a book, you, your answer shouldn't be, you're right. Your answer should be, let me just show you. Never look back over your shoulder. Always look forward to the next adventure, the next possibility. And always put yourself in the way of opportunities where there's no choice but to, but, but to succeed. And then you suddenly find yourself capable of achieving things that would have been impossible a few short months or years before. Uh, you know, there is nothing that you cannot do. Uh, pessimism is just an indulgence. Despair is an insult to your imagination. Um, you know, the, the, there is no limit to what any one individual can, can achieve. And so, the, you know, the world is just waiting for you. So don't let the, 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 the challenge of the world uh, beat you down. Um, have them inspire you to rise up, you know, on, on the wings of life, to do things that would have been impossible for your parents um, to imagine, but which will make your parents so proud of you. All right, we're getting some great questions today. I love these questions coming in uh, from our classrooms. Uh, it's great to see so many students are thinking about, um, you know, their communities and the world around them. We're going to head to Ottawa. We've got Mr. McElhaney joining us with his classroom. How are we doing, Mr. McElhaney? Hello there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, th this has been amazing, like hearing uh, all the wisdom that's uh, coming through here. One of my students had asked, um, let me just scroll up to her question, was asking about nature uh, and how being in nature has affected your daily life uh, and culture and your thought process. 
That is such a great question. And uh, I should say, Mr. you should get all your students out to the Royal Canadian Geographical Society out on Sussex Drive there in Ottawa. They'll welcome students anytime. And it's a wonderful institution. There's wonderful teaching tools and stuff. And uh, it's a wonderful um, uh, society we have in Canada with a beautiful headquarters right in Ottawa. But, you know, a friend of mine who, who was a founder of a big environmental organization in British Columbia, the Western Canada Wilderness um, committee. Uh, Paul George is a wonderful character. And I used to ask him, what was the most important thing we could do to encourage people to protect nature? And he said, get out in it. You know, um, every single great scientist from Tom Lovejoy to, to uh, Ed Wilson uh, to Darwin began as a bug collector. You know, uh, we, we, we all begin with a certain basic wonder about, about um, the, the world around us. And if our if our young people aren't exposed to that world of wonder, um, they th how can they possibly be expected to develop a sense of sort of stewardship and and uh, uh, ownership of it? I mean, one of one of the wonderful things that I see as an anthropologist in cultures around the world is this wonderful idea that people hold the key to the strength of nature, that we're not the problem, we're the solution. You know, many, many societies around the world believe that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. Many cultures around the world literally believe that their prayers and rituals maintain the balance of the world. Now, these these things, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's, again, how the belief system uh, uh, creates a different attitude towards a natural world. So I think the most important thing we can do um, if we want to kind of foment a, an environmental ethic deeply in the fiber of our being as a civilization is we have to get people out in it. I mean, Canada is blessed in that way. For most of our history, there were more lakes than people. You know, you, 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 could, you could throw England anywhere in Canada and the English would never find it. We have this incredible expanse of the north that runs away to, to the horizon. Well, let's get out and explore it because there's no country more beautiful in the world than Canada. There we go. Hilda and Sinova are trying to join. Oh, I see them. Let's bring them in. All right. There we go. It's always great. Hey, hey. good stuff. It's always great when the satellite lets us do this and have this little connection. Uh, last year, we weren't able to do this. So it's a real nice treat uh, to get to see the two of your faces at the end, of, sometimes at the beginning, sometimes at the end of the call. So, you know, I'd love to give you, Hilda and Sinova, a chance just to, you know, kind of give a, a, a final thought from, from Bum Sabu, from the Arctic. Yeah, um, oh, you want me to start? Yes, please. Oh, boy. Just, uh, you know, Wade, you're so inspirational. It's, um, we have, we have been sitting in a place with no distraction except
There we go. All right, Wade, go ahead. I'm so sorry, Joe. I couldn't hear any of the audio of, of what um, uh, Sunova and Hilda were saying. I don't think any of the, um, the audience could either. Oh. They, their mic was not on. That's strange. It's on speaker. Um, oh. Yeah, it came through over here. I've, I've got a bunch of private chat messages, unfortunately, uh, from Brampton and uh, London and uh, Brampton okay. again. Uh, Hilda, Sunova, do you want to? Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to try and share again? It came through here. Maybe I'll hold it closer to the the mic. Maybe it just got pulled back a little. No, no, it wasn't, Joe. Just uh, just okay. in, in a bit of information. It was not. Uh, it, it was not weak signal. It was completely nothing. So something was not. Uh, it was like a. It was like when someone hasn't uh, unmuted their microphone. All right, give that a go, Hilda and Sinova. Can you hear us now, Wade? Yeah. Yes. Now, now, now I can. And I let's see if the other uh, nice fan, uh, teachers can. Maybe they can let us know. Yeah, and look, we've got from Brampton, we've got Mrs. Uh, Cherry Trees, uh, the PS or Ms. Carr's class. Yeah, and Miss uh, Ma uh, Madame Boland. Yep, we're all set, I think, now. Thanks very much, you guys. Sorry. And, you know, the, the problem uh, with staying here for so long with not a lot of external stimulation is we don't have uh, the same memory, so I have no idea what I just said. Um, <laughs> but I, what I do want to share it, it with authenticity is um, what a privilege it's been for us to be in a place with, uh, with, with only the distractions of our natural world outside the door. No TV, um, no, you know, no cell phones going off. We just use this for photos. And, you know, you need to look at us as ice people. Uh, we are, we have spent our careers embracing the natural world and trying to live on the edge so that we don't take up a lot of space out there. And we're not done yet. Um, we felt it very important to come here at Bumsabu and host these calls with you, Joe, and we even, you know, uh, legends like Wade and Jane next week, um, and it, all because we all have something to offer. And uh, if we could look at what's outside as as, as, a, as a being, as, as an object that, that deserves our respect and love and inclusion in our life, and then we'll protect it. Um, so we look around us at the reindeer and the polar bear and the walrus and the eider ducks out the window, and we care about them deeply. It's like they become our friends. And so we just want to encourage all of you out there to do what Wade said, find some joy and like have some fun. There's so much seriousness out there. Go out there and, you know, have, have an intimate conversation with the insects in your yard or your tree or whatever it might be. Um, this is surely to light a fire within. Yeah, and I can just copy all that. Um, there are so much fun um, citizen science projects that you can do. Maybe you are interested in butterflies or, uh, like us, polar bears, or uh, even if you look up in the sky, we, we have for NASA, we have done uh, a globe observer um, almost every day um, when we have the satellites flying over here they are taking the pictures of the of the clouds from above and we take pictures of the clouds from 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 here from underneath and we have learned so much through this citizen science program we have even learned that the sky or the clouds are sort of cooperating with the ocean so we can just try to inspire you guys to go out in the nature, up in the mountains, woods, up the sea, um, and get to know the nature. Because we do, we know that we do um, need to know more about it in order to protect it. We protect what we love. And can I share one more thing? Absolutely. And just to the point of differences and biodiversity of species is. We need to all respect our differences. Uh, none of us are alike, but we are. We do all come from the same cloth. So it just it behooves us to understand uh, and embrace those differences. All That's right. Cool. Yeah, Joe. Can I just add to that? Uh, yeah, all right. Quick thought. First of all, I think we should recognize that we have some two real heroes here with us today, and you know. For all the joy of spending 17 months alone in a small hut in the Arctic, it's also really tough. And um, and it's it's people like this who are out on the frontier 
um, that really become our, our in our they're they're kind of like our scouts, aren't they? The scouts into the realm of the wild. And it's important for every kid who's listening to this to know that they can do that too. You know, sometimes when you're young, and I can remember this, you know, you look at, at someone, it could be a hockey star, it could be a movie star, it could be a, a writer, it could be someone famous in your neighborhood, and you think, oh, I can never do that. How could I possibly do that? And you forget that the reason they seem so uh, accomplished, say, is because someone like me, I'm 67 years old, I've had lots of time, you're a kid, but you'll do it too. And, and when, you know, your, your career is not like a, a jacket you put on. It's something that grows around you step by step. Always follow your passion. If you follow your passion, you'll be great at whatever you do. If you think you can compromise and scheme your way into a life where you say, I'll do this for 40 years because then I'll make money and then I'll do my passion. I promise you, by the time you get there, you'll have forgotten what your passion is. N nothing is beneath you. Nothing is a waste of time unless you make it so. A taxi cab driver can easily have as much to teach you as a Harvard professor. You know, it, 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 life is all about one step at a time, one achievement at a time, one moment at a time. And before you know it, you've completed the journey of a lifetime. All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge thank you to our YouTube community. They were so vocal today with so many great questions. Thank you to our live classrooms uh, across Canada as well who join us in camera spots. Uh, Wade, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your advice, your wisdom, uh, and bringing to light not only biodiversity, but also our cultural biodiversity and how important that is. And Hilda and Sunova, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us live today. Great uh, to see both of you. Uh, uh, Wade. Can we have dinner when we come to PC this summer? Oh, I'll cook you dinner. I'll cook you dinner. And and uh, I'll make sure it's, 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 it's whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe, thanks for having me, my friend. And thanks to uh, Sunaba and Hilde for every, everything you've done and for being kind enough to invite me onto this great broadcast. All right. Well, big shout out to everybody. Join us on the 13th with Jane Goodall. It's going to be a blast. Our final session. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.